Thiele Lang. I'm a deputy director at the Leibniz Institute for Regional Geography, Leibniz Institute for Länderkunde in Leipzig. Our panel was about uh, Chinese investments in infrastructures uh, across Europe, basically uh, linked to the question of a new Cold War through infrastructure investments. Key takeaway from the panel was maybe that uh, in the past years, uh, infrastructure investments were mainly seen as a territorial question, also as a, a response to pressing needs to uh, renew infrastructures across Europe without giving uh, enough attention to uh, geoeconomic aspects, geopolitical aspects, which are obviously inscribed into infrastructure financialization. Uh, very visible in the past years and even weeks. Surely this idea of getting geopolitical uh, influence through infrastructure investments uh, is a quite pressing one and it, it will certainly change our perspective on globalization. While we have rather seen globalization in the past years as being driven by further economic integration, the rise of China as an economic power, uh, with this focus on infrastructures, we also see that uh, China uses its economic power also to invest uh, in infrastructure connections and uh, thereby creates new realities which are to be respected also in a, in a geopolitical sense. The, the recent GLOBE Annual Conference 2022 with the title of Watershed in the Global Condition and welcome to our parallel panel slot this morning to the panel on the rise of Chinese infrastructure investments in Europe and the new Cold War. So as you can guess from the title of this panel, um, the panel is about changes in geopolitics through infrastructure investments and particularly focusing on the changing role of China in this global geopolitical relations. Um, actually, the panelists today, we are all collaborating together. Sorry. Uh, some technical issues here in the room. The panelists today are all collaborating uh, on various issues and project proposals. So uh, the panelists are well known to each other and uh, we're actually very happy to be able to share our work of the past two years now at this conference. Let me briefly introduce you to the concept of the panel and uh, the way we thought to organize the panel. We have four speakers, one moderator, that's myself. My name is Thilo Lang. I'm a deputy director at the Leibniz Institute for Regional Geography and also lecturer at the Global and European Studies Institute here at Leipzig University. We will have four presentations. The first presentation will be by Leila Rekviashvili, a postdoc researcher at Leibniz Institute for Regional Geography in Leipzig currently in uh, quarantine, so working from home, otherwise she would have joined as well. Second speaker will be Margot Schiller from the Giga Institute in Hamburg, uh, institute focusing on global and area studies with a subsection focusing on relations to Asia and China particularly. And then we will have two speakers from the Center of Urban and Regional Development Studies at Newcastle University, uh, Keen van Lim, uh, Senior Lecturer for Economic Geography, and Andy Pike, uh, Professor for Regional Development Studies, both in the same department. I don't want to waste more time introducing the panel and rather give more space to the speakers. We would go through the speakers' presentations, uh, interrupted by questions of understanding, and then would try to have a common discussion towards the end of our, in the second half of the panel, once we had listened to all the four presentations. So welcome online, Leila, Margot, Andy, and Keen. Leila will be our first speaker. Thanks for joining us uh, from Hamburg and Newcastle. And from home, Leila, we are very glad that uh, 
you turned well enough to present today. Um, we're very much looking forward to the, your presentation on the question, are Chinese infrastructure investments special? Competition and collaboration between rival hegemonic powers in financing and developing large-scale infrastructure projects in Georgia. The floor is yours. Many thanks for kind introductions, Tilo, and I welcome everybody to the panel and warmly thank all of you for being here with, with us. Um, as Tilo was saying, I might be a little dizzy today, so I ask for forgiveness in advance, and I'll try to walk you through this paper that Tilo and myself have been working about large infrastructure projects in Georgia um, that uh, we intend to understand as contested on multiple scales. So where this, let's say, thought for this presentation comes in is the construction of primarily Chinese uh, infrastructure-related investments in Eastern Europe as something particularly threatening, right? And I give you here uh, a little glimpse into how Western media would speak about Chinese investments, right? And the headlines would be Chinese octopus, how China is taking over the Soviet space. And if there will have been an objection to this very negative portrayal of Chinese investments, it would be also uh, not to say that necessarily um, the issue is more complex, but to say, well, but China is not that present in Eastern Europe. And um, I would say more sad fact has been that the research has been also fairly in line with media discourses in a sense of also quite consistently singling out Chinese infrastructural investments and constructing them as um, a range of threats. So on the one hand, Chinese investments are all, uh, you know, seen as also opportunities, especially for Central and Eastern European countries and uh, post-Soviet space in acknowledgement of uh, needs of infrastructural upgrade of these countries. Uh, but the next thing is on the other hand, it is uh, Chinese investments are said to have a lot of risks and threats. Now, it's not this statement necessarily that we want to contest. Um, and it's not that we do, like, one could argue that uh, there are no risks. But the problem that we found with this kind of approach that is currently applied to studying Chinese investments in uh, Soviet Eurasia and Central and Eastern Europe is that um, such literature very consistently looks on nation state level. So they ask, would Hungary benefit from, um, from I don't know, Belgrade Budapest railway? Would Georgia benefit uh, from this big uh, residential um, area that the Chinese investors built up? Um, and disregarding that um, the interest of nation state might not always align uh, with the um, interests and uh, needs of various parts of the receiving societies, right? Another challenge with this literature has been that there has been always this um, implicit assumption that European or Western financing tools are far superior. However, in terms of research design, Chinese investments in the East, in post-socialist East, have been very consistently studied um, on their own right. So it would not be that, it would not be explicit comparative studies comparing similar kinds of investments accomplished through different financing um, instruments, but it would be only focusing on Chinese investments. Um, and again, as I already mentioned, uh, such attitude has very often dismissed the importance of locally um, growing struggles against infrastructural investments that are linked to Chinese actors, but they are also linked um, to other funding and financing uh, arrangements. So in contrast, what we try to offer here is to, on the one hand, contextualize Chinese investments as it's not something very unique, self-contained and kind of other beast, but as something that has been part of global uh, turn uh, sometimes referred to as infrastructural turn um, or as infrastructure-led development that has been the process uh, which is also driven by China, but as well driven by major 
uh, European powers, large multilateral development banks and financial institutions. Um, and such literature kind of helps us uh, recast a different light um, to the Chinese investments in post-socialist East, the literature, as Tilo mentioned, uh, that focuses on the uh, new Cold War uh, or the emergence of new Cold War in which uh, on the one hand, we see the contestation between rival hegemonic powers. Most often uh, it is seen uh, as a contestation between the US and China, but also their regional allies that Europe has clearly always been for China, uh, for, for, uh, for the US. And now we see very clearly Russia aligning or China and Russia aligning on the other hand. Uh, but the key there is also that uh, even though that we observe this contestation and competition in who shapes uh, large infrastructure projects, but also large scale infrastructural integration projects, big projects like Belt and Road Initiative, big projects that now Europe and US are also putting together um, to counter uh, Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, but on the other hand, to acknowledge that there has been a consensus across uh, the rival powers in portraying infrastructural integration and infrastructural investments as a developmental heyday. And in that, West has played uh, just as big of a role, if not bigger, um, as China. Um, and even there, we will have this disregard because you always focus on this transnational contestation. We have this disregard in understanding how infrastructural projects unfold locally and are contested locally. So what we focus on and what we suggest is to look at infrastructures as contested at multiple scales to understand, uh, because they're also constructed at multiple scales. Um, and if we take these multi-scholar contestations, what we would argue is that methodologically, then we need to bring in comparison, not just across states, but across different infrastructural projects um, accomplished through different financing and governance arrangements. And conceptually, this would also allow us to pay more attention to the significance of localized struggles. Now, to, um, in a way, have an exercise, have a go in uh, understanding how, what would we see differently about infrastructural investments or Chinese infrastructural investments in the East, if we looked at them from a multi-scholar perspective, we took this case of Georgia, and it's a it's a, a trick like methodological trick where we do focus within one national context, but it's not the significance of national context that we are interested in. But we have this single national context in which we look at different infrastructure projects and how various actors from different rival powers interact. Um, uh, among each other and with the national governments and with the local populations. Uh, so we took essentially uh, the key for, um, and even a bit more, um, large scale infrastructural projects that were portrayed as this kind of big regional development projects um, and looked at how and where and in which are they contested. Some of them um, are including Chinese investors, some of them are principally invest, like um, Chinese um, funded projects, but some of them are also the projects that um, either European Union actors or US associated actors have been pursuing. So this is essentially, we have this overview of all uh, large scale projects, development like regional development until projects within Georgian context that have been contested throughout the past five years. Now, if we look at it that way, then we can separate in a way or separate a bit uh, what kind of contestations we, we observe in these situations. And one is, as we would expect from the literature, great power rivalry over infrastructures. In Georgian context, you don't observe it so much, but there is this one um, and un, like unsuccessful or a currently stalled project of the port of Anaglia. And there you could see that uh, indeed uh, it was Chinese actors competing with the US based company to win the bid of constructing Anaglia. Uh, what happened was that it was 
US and Georgian consortium that won the project, yet also Chinese construction companies then won smaller bids to construct certain parts of the port. At some point, project was canceled essentially. And then you can still see this continuation of contestation discourse where US-based observers would say, well, but we have to reinvest in this project because if US doesn't invest there, um, then it will be again Chinese investors that will take over um, the, the, the project. But even already at that stage, you can see that this contestation, transnational contestation is not necessarily mutually exclusive because even if one party dominates, there is always a possibility that companies from other sides will be engaged either in the construction work or in co-financing and so on. Uh, but a very interesting aspect of contestation that very often is not uh, so present in the literature is what happens between national authorities and transnational developers and financiers. And even though national governments very often come across as if they're collaborating very well with financial institutions and uh, private investors or state-owned uh, companies from elsewhere, um, you very often also see, at least on the example of these cases, <clears throat> that national governments do uh, get into major conflicts with either development for comp uh, or companies or financial institutions. And Anaclia serves again as a very good case. Because what we saw in Anaclia, why the reason, the reason why the projects failed was precisely uh, because companies started blaming the government for scaring away the uh, donor institutions, that is big financial institutions, including uh, EBRD, EIB, but also Asian development banks like ADB and China's Asian Investment uh, Bank uh, or China led. Um, so what happened in this case, there was a collaboration between financial institutions that are rooted in Western as well as Chinese or Japanese context. Um, and the financial institutions essentially came to the government asking them to sign off on the contract, which included that biggest fiscal risks would be assured by the state. And this was the context where the, the state said, no, we cannot sign such an agreement in this sense, right? Um, and ultimately it was this refusal of the Georgian government to sign off on the kind of risky deal or to assure the risks of the project that led to the failure. Sometimes though, financial institutions serve as a leverage for governments against developer companies um, and kind of support the government to deal with the developer companies. And this was the case uh, in the construction of highway in, in a Georgian context, where um, World Bank was financing um, the, the construction, Chinese uh, construction companies were developing the project and Georgian government found a problem with the tender. So what World Bank did was that they barred this company for nine months from World Bank financed projects worldwide, right? So in this sense, financial institutions also serve as um, a space to which national governments can appeal to. Um, I will skip on arbitration courts, but these also come as very interesting contestation mechanisms. And usually um, it will be companies, and again, various companies, companies coming from China, also companies coming from Russia and the West will appeal to Western institutions. And especially in cases when uh, the local government has signed off uh, a lot of risk assurance on contracts with private companies, um, these companies will find, way, like, will find it easy to have arbitration courts confirm uh, that they have, uh, that the government would need to pay compensation for this or that. Now what happens, and this is a very interesting aspect in terms of this um, contestation from national state versus uh, transnational actors is uh, that sometimes when uh, Georgian government, and this is the case with Frontera company from the US, Georgian government took them to international arbitration court and won the case. But what happened then was that the US based company appealed to local senators to put pressure on Georgian government. And, you know, US senators came out saying, 
oh, Georgia is treating, uh, is, is, is um, mistreating the um, American company. We cannot have this. This is return to Soviet Union, et cetera, et cetera. So actually this discursive uh, trick worked very well. And even if Georgian government could pursue um, this US-based company farther, they kind of abstained and let the company have um, hundreds of thousands of debts that they didn't repay to their workers, right? So this pressure that can come from powerful governments towards smaller governments uh, like Georgia can also work um, in a way as a space of contestation. And the very last one is um, the local struggles. And this, this has been very underestimated, but it, again, in this context, if we look at a couple of large infrastructure projects, we can see that quite a bit of them have been canceled because of local mobilization. And I'll skip because I feel like maybe I'm talking too much. Um, I'll skip some of the examples and focus on the example against uh, a large hydropower plant in one of the mountainous regions of Georgia uh, called Nenskra. And this is a very interesting case because you had primarily uh, European banks, EBRD and IDB financing this project. It would be then Korean company that would uh, accomplish, like that would construct the dam. Um, and you had this very strong local mobilization, local mobilizers linked up to national civil societies. And they also, national civil societies linked up to transnational civil and environmental civil societies. And what they did was to put pressure back to international financial institutions. And then EBRD and EIB uh, looked into the, the project, and even though they were there when the contract was signed, uh, they said, well, but this is indeed an unfair contract. Local population was uh, treated unfairly. So they essentially uh, supported the situation where the project was stalled. Uh, looking at all of this complex uh, scales and layers of contestation, what uh, preliminary, I think, suggestions from us would be, would be to um, also look at the flaws of Western investment practices when we talk of, um, uh, when we primarily demonize Chinese ones. And I think there, the important part is, is, is not to directly compare which investors would be worse than uh, the other, uh, but the issue would be to look also at who has shaped in state institutional context in which uh, infrastructure deals are made. And if you look at this context, that it's, it's super clear that it has been primarily Western financial institutions that have defined the infrastructure investment landscapes. And now it will be um, Western, Chinese, Russian, Turkish, and other investors that will be tapping in and reproducing the same, like quite similar dynamic um, in terms of um, you know, pursuing investments. Um, Another observation is that collaboration across different institutions, especially when it comes to financial institutions is very strong. So, so far what we can see is that um, institutions like EBRD and uh, ADB and AEEP will be just very easily and closely collaborating. So contestations might be a bit, emphasis on transnational contestations sometimes might be a, a bit exaggerated and undermining how much collaboration there is. The next thing I find it very interesting is, and this we of course know, like we know that uh, international financial institutions and multilateral development banks are at the frontier of uh, supporting infrastructure-led development. But what this um, comparative infrastructural case is showing is that they really take on um, very complex roles in such contexts. They do shape the projects, they support the international investment companies, but at points they also support the national governments versus international companies. And at other points, they also support local civil society um, in, in fighting uh, private companies or the government, right? So this is just a very complex picture about multilateral development banks um, that um, comes through. And the last and most important thing is to emphasize that um, it's important to understand local class and location-based struggles, because if we always, like we do now, look at these investment projects with the question in mind whether Georgia would benefit, it's clear that for some of the projects, Georgian political elites would be happy to go for it. But it will be the concerns of those 
um, lower classes or uh, peripheralized classes um, that will have to bear largest social and environmental risks and burdens, but benefit the least of the projects. Um, that is very important. So the, the question of who benefits needs to look deeper than the nation state scale. I'll stop here. I hope I'm not too much over the time because I didn't observe myself very well. Thanks so much. Thank you very much, uh, Leila, for your presentation. I have to try and look into the camera that you also see me. Uh, we are to serve like both audiences. I would like to take now a couple of minutes to clarify questions of understanding from within the room here in the conference site um, and also online. So the listeners in the Zoom room, um, feel free also to ask questions uh, with the chat function. Um, or raise your hand with Zoom and uh, we, we can check and take you in to pose questions directly uh, together with my co-moderator Franz sitting also here. Um, so first of all, questions of clarification, then we would go on with the presentations and spare some time on the big question, like the big question of this conference as well for a joint discussion. Elisabeth Kaske has a question online. I'll just, Elisabeth, do, do you want to raise your question directly? Um, Franz, is that possible? Yeah, I, I can. Uh, I, I was just wondering, I mean, it's, it's pretty clear that there are flaws in Western investments, and it's also very good to um, point them out, um, uh, especially in, in our kind of uh, black and white triumphalist uh, media sometimes. Uh, but uh, my, my question is, do Chinese investors do things differently? Uh, do they study the flaws of Western uh, investors and, and just uh, um, have different ideas? Or is it all the same? Thanks so much for the question. I think there we would need more directly comparative work on this to understand that question. Um, and we do have some work um, that does show that not necessarily, you know, Chinese investors are not doing things far better than Western ones, and it will be case by case. Um, and they, there might be specific risks that are associated to Chinese investments, right? But the question is rather for me, uh, a more interesting one is that it is still, at least in some parts of uh, uh, post-socialist East, because I think the situation has changed very much in Central Asian context um, in this regard. Uh, the point is that the whole institutional setting um, is so far largely shaped by Western um, financial institutions and uh, governments and um, supranational institutions. And it is then in this context where Chinese investors exploit the context um, the, in similar ways or not in substantially different ways as all sorts of other investors do. And this is like the point is to say, there might be of course small differences, but China cannot be singled out to the degree that it is singled out currently. But not to say that necessarily they're um, doing very different job. Okay, the thanks comes from Elizabeth directly. So I suppose the question has been well answered. And I suggest we go on with the second speaker in our panel. Um, welcome once again to Margot Schiller, uh, joining us from Hamburg. Um, no further introduction uh, to have time for your presentation. Uh, your title is Competing Connectivity Strategies, Challenges and Prospects for European Union-China Collaboration on Transport Infrastructure. Margot is really a year-long, very experienced researcher on EU-China relations, and we're very much looking forward to your presentation. Thank you, Chilo, for this nice introduction. So my, my topic is uh, competing connectivity strategies, challenges and prospects for European Union-China collaboration in transport infrastructure. Transport infrastructure or transport policy 
is very important to the European Union because this is a basis, a physical basis of a common market. So the European Parliament and the EU Commission has paid a lot of attention to that development. And uh, when China um, started its uh, Bed and Road Initiative in 2013, uh, the Eastern and Central European countries uh, became the focus of Chinese investment because these countries uh, represent a logistic corridor that connects uh, China or Asia with Western European markets. Um, and at the same time, these countries, some at least of them are not member of the European Union, they are candidate countries, but others are member of the country. So for them, the um, common regulatory framework of the EU is very important uh, to stick to. So what is the uh, regulatory framework? Um, most important is the so-called trans-European transport network policy, it's TENT. And uh, this is a common transport policy, but we have to say that uh, the EU Commission uh, has only a, a limited competency in policy making uh, for the implementation of the EU policy. It depends on the single, on the, each member country. So that means that uh, the members, uh, member countries have uh, sort of discretion and can uh, use a bargaining power to get uh, better um, uh, funding from the EU. So this EU common, uh, common policy and the tent has started already a long time ago and uh, it has nine uh, core network corridors. And you can see it here from the uh, picture and uh, the thing is that uh, the regulatory framework, as I said, it, it is focusing on this transport policy. And especially the EU has a complete competency in the EU-wide public procurement rules and procedures. This is very important because then uh, uh, often these uh, construction projects uh, uh, have to, uh, not often, they have to stick to this uh, uh, rules and regulation. And then comes a problem in <laughs> because these uh, Central and Eastern European countries uh, have been sort of neglected uh, by funding and um, uh, felt that they uh, need to have uh, China at their side. Paying the China card becomes important to them. And of course, the Chinese government also paid a lot of attention and created this 16 plus one initiative uh, uh, with Greece uh, joining that initiative uh, some years ago, it is a 17 plus one initiative. And the idea is to have closer relations with these countries. And, uh, and these countries, of course, they expected China to invest more uh, direct investment in their countries and to increase trade with China. Uh, some of these expectations, of course, <laughs> um, uh, they have not been so fulfilled and uh, some of these countries are quite disappointed. Um, at, at the same time, the main idea of the EU Commission was that um, uh, the tent and some um, connectivity, plat uh, connectivity uh, areas can, um, um, uh, can join. And so they set up this EU China connectivity platform in 2015. And the idea was to select uh, some projects uh, for the European Union to invest in China and for China to invest in uh, the Central and Eastern European countries. And here are some of these uh, projects. So um, if we look at this uh, development, this uh, emergence of uh, China as a provider of infrastructure, um, and uh, we can look at it from a geopolitical perspective. Um, we have uh, different national actors that have uh, their own connectivity agendas based on their norms and uh, values. And um, uh, Singh Galila also mentioned that connectivity is not only relating to the construction of uh, uh, roads and railways, but also includes a lot of other policy issues like regional integration schemes or trade arrangement, technical standards. This is also part of the connectivity policy of countries. 
And um, uh, the Belgian Road Initiative, of course, is one of the key foreign policy initiatives. And it has a potential to increase uh, the country's geopolitical influence at the expense of the US and China, uh, US and the EU. And this is a problem now we are facing in this uh, area of increasing uh, geopolitical tension. And uh, China's growing strength, its political influence, and of course, the so-called new ass uh, assertiveness in recent years have changed the narrative uh, in the EU-China relation. That means now the, uh, uh, China is uh, regarded as an economic competitor and a systemic rival. And this is uh, the wording we are using to describe the relationship with China today. And recently, uh, the tension between the US and China about the Indo-Pacific um, Indo region, of course, this has increased the geopolitical rivalry between these two countries again. So this is a, the policy setting uh, we have to look at if we uh, want to see what the competing strategies are. I hope now you can see the next slide. Yeah, okay, I here listed some of these uh, uh, connectivity strategies. Uh, the Better Note uh, Initiative by China already uh, mentioned, and this is a very comprehensive strategy. Um, you had a look at the uh, picture at the beginning. It has uh, both a land route and a maritime route uh, for connectivity, and uh, it is focusing on China and Asia, and of course, some of other countries are included as well, Latin America and Africa. And uh, it is interesting that after some critics by um, other countries um, in 2018, especially uh, the Chinese government changed and adapted to some of their uh, rules and regulation or norms and values, at least uh, 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 officially, they said that they want to have a more focus on sustainability and transparency and uh, the idea that uh, investment has to be um, sound and uh, well-sounded investment, uh, financial sounded. Uh, this is also included in the new uh, policy of the Chinese government. And here then uh, the EU Global Gateway, uh, which was um, announced in December last year, uh, this is um, uh, based on a completely different set of norms and value, uh, explicitly on democratic value, sustainable infrastructure, rules-based approach, and of course, serving the EU policy goals, especially the Green Deal. So it is very much uh, uh, directed at including the um, idea that it has to be sustainable in, the, in terms of uh, um, ecological uh, transformation, digital transformation, human rights policy, and the idea of uh, effective multilateralism. And um, some other of these connectivity strategies they are also very much based on this uh, European or Western values. Uh, for example, the US Blue Dot Network, this is more a mechanism to certify qualitative uh, quality infrastructure and uh, the uh, cooperation partners are US, uh, UK and Australia, or that there is this uh, uh, G7's Build Back a Better World, Build Back a Better World. <laughs> the idea is also that uh, 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 developing guiding principles uh, for um, uh, infrastructure investment. And then maybe um, after the European uh, initiative, the most important one is uh, the Japanese Free and Open Indo-Pacific uh, initiative. Uh, it has also the idea of have a quality infrastructure investment and is based on G20 values, openness, transparency, efficiency, and fiscal soundness. Um, and there are some others which I don't want to mention here, but you can see that uh, from this list, which gives only some ideas about the characteristics of these uh, different uh, connectivity strategies, that there is this competition about uh, um, uh, yeah, focusing on infrastructure and of course, um, having some geopolitical interests as well. 
so uh, just a few words about the changing policy framework of the EU engagement. Uh, since 2013, um, we can observe that uh, the US, uh, the European Union has changed their engagement and have tried to counterbalance the Belt and Road Initiative's uh, impact uh, in Europe. And uh, in 2018, for example, they have set up their Connecting Europe and Asia Building Blocks for the EU strategy. And um, uh, next slide then, uh, they have also uh, um, published two documents which are uh, directed at screening uh, the uh, Chinese investment, not Chinese investment, but investment in critical infrastructure. This uh, was uh, published by in a document in 2019. And um, of course, and they have tried to um, enforce that uh, their own uh, criteria, norms and values are set up in these documents. Um, very important, uh, these two um, initiatives, the Joint Communication on Connecting Europe and Asia, published in 2018, and the Global Gateway from last year. There are, are the documents in which um, the values and norms and the approach of the European Union is best uh, uh, documented, uh, the sustainability, comprehensiveness, international rule-based rule uh, approach. These are the characteristics and the Global Gateway uh, is very ambitious, but I think uh, the most important uh, issue here is that if uh, the European Union really can provide uh, funding uh, similar to the Chinese funding for building infrastructure um, projects. Uh, um, they talked about 300 billion uh, euro for this uh, project in the next few years, but uh, um, it depends on how they can uh, find additional funding from international and multinational institutions, and of course, from the private sector. So uh, let's come to my last slide. It's about open questions, uh, because I think that uh, if you talk about the Belt and Road uh, compared to the uh, European or other com uh, connectivity platforms, uh, we have first to think that uh, is this a, a, a strategy which uh, will better include, uh, for example, uh, the Central and Eastern European uh, countries uh, and, and as well as Central Asian countries? Or uh, do we have to really uh, think that this is threatening uh, the European um, value system? and um, we have this competition between the Belt and Road approach and the European Global Gateway Initiative. And um, we have to see if uh, the European side is, will be able uh, to provide the finance and uh, uh, to enforce its own value set in this uh, uh, competition uh, of different uh, connectivity uh, strategies. Thank you. This is it from my side. Thank you very much, Margot, uh, for your presentation. Uh, again, we'll take a couple of minutes for immediate questions of clarification. Any questions uh, from the online audience or here's one in the room? Yes, please. Maybe, can you also say your name and where you're from to start your question? Yeah, for sure. My name is Daniel. Um, I'm from Mexico and I'm an energy student in, in Leipzig. So I guess my question is a little bit regarding your last open question, which I found, like the one before, which I found really interesting, where you say whether the Belt and Road Initiative has the power to disintegrate the European Union. Um, why, why, why do you think the Belt and Road Initiative would even affect the integrity of the European Union? That's, that's my question, like, how, how would it affect it? I think that uh, the Belt Road Initiative, uh, with its uh, funding of uh, special projects like uh, harbors or uh, very important um, uh, digital um, uh, connectivity bases, there has a potential to create economic growth in one region at the expense of others. 
So for example, if we look at Hamburg, I'm coming from Hamburg, the Hamburg Harbor has been suffering because now the freight volume is redirected uh, from um, uh, the maritime side uh, for the Hamburg Harbor. Uh, and now it goes through the Piraeus uh, uh, port in Greece. So we have uh, sort of uh, changing landscapes, changing growth models and changing uh, maybe industrial um, uh, development as well. So we have some unintended maybe <laughs> um, impact by this uh, kind of uh, infrastructure investment and we have to compensate maybe that. Uh, this is one side. And the other thing is that uh, because uh, the European Commission is sort of weak when it comes to the enforcement of its uh, transport policy or maybe policy in other areas, in the energy sector, for example, uh, there is the chance that the um, uh, countries uh, very much in need of this infrastructure investment will not just stick to the common interest uh, for, for example, having a, a well-connected uh, um, network of uh, infrastructure projects, but uh, uh, looking only for their own interests. So, there is this um, danger. And the second thing is that, of course, we have to think about our own infrastructure uh, industry, how it will be pushed out of the market. So there's a lot of uh, um, uh, challenges we have to face uh, if uh, we cannot um, really counterbalance the Chinese influence. And thanks again uh, once more to Margot for your presentation and we will get back to your big questions and the big questions of the panel uh, towards the end. Our next speaker in the panel is Keen van Lim. Once more, welcome Keen. Thank you very much for joining us uh, from the UK uh, one hour early, I suppose. Thank um, you. Heen has been working on the China model of economic development and uh, China economic and uh, financial strategies for years already. Uh, published uh, uh, a book in 2017 on the topic, which is surely worth reading. We're very happy to have you with us. And your topic for today is From the City of Steel to Germany's China City. Economic Restructuring, the EU-China Transcontinental Railway, and infrastructure-led development in Duisburg. So the floor is yours, Kim. Yeah, thanks, Thilo. Um, I'll just um, share the screen for the slides. Right, um, a very good morning, everybody. And um, first of all, I would like to thank um, Thilo and um, Lila for um, uh, um, the kind invitation to join um, this panel. I'm really very happy to be able to speak about these um, um, ongoing um, project that, or rather a project that is coming to the end um, as we put the, the paper together. Um, so it is a, a study that has um, taken place over um, the past five years and um, was originally um, supported by um, the British um, Academy. And then subsequently um, we um, obtain further support from Newcastle University to deepen um, the research. And um, these um, study actually, um, on Duisburg's connection with um, China, so through the EU-China Transcontinental Railway. I think it builds very nicely um, on Margot's um, presentation earlier about um, the um, China establishing connectivity strategies and um, the ongoing um, competition all right, for connectivity. Because um, in, in a very interesting historical um, way, um, these um, EU-China um, Transcontinental Connection um, actually preceded um, the Belt and Road um, Initiative and the high profile um, attempt at um, um, transcontinental um, connectivity that we all know um, today. So um, hopefully that provides a more uh, a nuanced perspective on um, the, uh, the logics and the rationale and um, the effects of um, China infrastructural um, investments and their potential um, impacts on um, subnational um, regions. So um, that's, uh, um, you know, I, I think in, in, in this sense, it offers something really concrete from a case study perspective. Um, and if we take a, a, a historical perspective, um, the onset of um, the project, or rather the, the, the impetus and the actors driving the project actually preceded the Belt and Road Initiative. And um, in many ways, as I will explain uh, in, in, in a moment, it actually converged 
um, very nicely with um, what was happening in Duisburg um, and um, the, the aim and goals of um, Duisport, um, the main port author authority um, in trying to uh, uh, strategically reposition um, itself. So there, um, it, it is a very timely interaction between um, different um, interests. And I think um, in, in a historical sense, um, what is most significant um, is that you know, it preceded the Bell and Road um, Initiative, and then it became the platform for subsequent um, um, expansion of um, connectivity. So let's start with um, these um, pictures. So uh, in 2014, um, the Chinese uh, president, um, um, Xi Jinping, visited Duisburg to celebrate um, the connection um, um, that of the uh, uh, Duisburg and Chongqing um, in um, central China. And um, here we have um, Duisburg very um, clearly in the map, and it is a, a very important hub, um, so important that um, the Chinese president uh, has arrived there to welcome the incoming train from um, um, Chongqing from central China. That's the reason why um, it is um, central China that um, um, there was a far, like the starting point of this um, railway, because uh, as I'll explain in a moment, right, central China was the place where this um, railway was uh, initiated and launched. Right, so um, there are some um, local and regional impetuses that um, led to the uh, emergence of this transcontinental railway. So this transcontinental railway um, became very high profile after C's visit, right? But it was still um, very uh, uh, nascent. Uh, it is an infancy at the moment, uh, at that time, and. Um, a more uh, contemporary picture, as we can see from this map that um, we um, drew last year, is that um, the connection has now pro proliferated um, in um, many ways. And within China, there are multiple hubs now um, that um, sought to connect um, to this network and that cuts across two major routes. One is so-called the so-called Southern Route via Hogos um, and the Kazakhstan, and then through Russia, and um, um, then it enters the European Union. And the other is the more uh, uh, traditional route via Siberia, and um, also through Russia. All right. Of course, um, with Russia very firmly in the picture, what will happen to this railway? Um, um, you know, uh, with ongoing uh, and emerging um, sanctions, is another uh, major question um, to be discussed because it has a direct impact on connectivity. But um, we can see then, uh, um, uh, 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 right, from uh, until last year, um, the transcontinental um, connectivity is proliferating and um, the number of cities that uh, this railway is um, um, reaching in um, Europe is just um, illustrative uh, with a few major cities here, uh, Madrid, Lisbon, Paris, um, um, London, um, Hamburg. The more, more important point um, is that um, Duisburg has now firmly become um, the hub of this um, transcontinental um, rail connection. So today, in today's presentation, I'm trying to keep it very um, crisp, uh, but I have um, uh, an entire paper that is um, in its final um, stage now, and I, th I hope to have it submitted within um, the next uh, uh, um, two weeks. So any um, questions would be really um, helpful. But um, in today's presentation, I, I would like to um, present two questions um, that um, I hope the discussion will then um, address and you know, then it will hopefully um, lead to um, further discussions. So the, the presentation, I mean, the first question is, um, I would like to um, answer this, um, that is whether the EU-China Transcontinental Railway, whether it marks an outcome right, of World Bank Stout um, getting the territory right in terms of infrastructure-led um, investment. So there is a very uh, a rich and emerging um, literature right, on um, um, having to um, get the infrastructure correct and um, um, coming up with the right spatial planning, right? often short-termist and very targeted um, planning, right, so that um, places can become quickly connected to global production networks and um, global markets. So um, these um, became very prominent after the 2008 financial crisis, um, when the World Bank um, then um, proposed um, in its um, reshaping economic geography world development report that um, it is fine and potentially helpful for um, um, interventions, right, spatial interventions in order to um, enhance pl uh, places developmental potential. But the broader question is, um, is this a recommendation applicable and helpful for explaining um, what has happened um, in the case of the transcontinental railway and more significantly in the context of um, Duisburg? Is it um, um, 
a useful and helpful explanatory tool. And when we talk about this book, we have to consider um, the effects of the inherited steel making um, legacy, right? Which um, it is um, um, very uh, important and it's still a very important um, legacy. Although there are there have been ongoing attempts to restructure the economy and uh, to move away from um, the um, so-called um, path dependence, all right, on steel making. So, what are the effects of inherited steel making? Uh, the inherited steel making legacy is something that we need to consider, even though it is not the main subject of the study. In that I did not interview laid off um, steel makers, uh, steel workers um, in, in Duisburg, but that is a, an effect of the legacy that um, actually coexists and um, co-evolve uh, with um, the emergence of these transcontinental railway. So these are the two questions I hope to address in um, this um, short period, but I really um, welcome um, further questions and opportunities to elaborate on the, the key points. Right, so um, very, uh, Succinctly, I would like to provide an explanation of um, what's happening here in um, Duisburg and um, the primary argument um, after our research, which is more uh, both historical in the sense that we looked at um, the data and the restructuring strategies of Duisburg extending back to the 1960s, right? And um, we um, looked at uh, Duisburg's uh, industrial uh, restructuring process, and um, it became very apparent that it was very bumpy. And um, even just a few years ago, there were um, high profile protests uh, um, against uh, um, Thyssen Krupp's uh, um, attempt to um, restructure its operations, which mean uh, more lay layoffs. And so, you know, it is a, a very a bumpy industrial um, restructuring process. And amidst this um, restructuring process, all right, and this all preceded um, the Bell and Road Initiative. All right, before the uh, in the midst of this um, restructuring process, infrastructure led development has already become um, integral. Right. So it is before, well before the transcontinental rail connection. And as we know, um, over um, the past um, um, two decades, Duisburg has become a very important inland um, port. Right. When we started the project, it was the world's um, largest um, um, inland port. All right. And um, yesterday, I just checked whether um, this uh, remains the case. And it still does appear that Duisburg is still the world's largest um, inland um, port. So it is very clear that um, infrastructure-led development has become integral um, to drive um, economic restructuring, right? What we found was that, or rather the question that came to us was why it did not, um, in spite of the, um, the, the relative success of um, um, logistics, right, in Duisburg's economy, how, it, why, and how and why it hasn't been able to um, generate um, the kind of um, sharp growth um, impact on the city in that the city continue to be um, um, facing, uh, continue to face um, multiple challenges with regard to um, the legacies of, um, or rather the structural issues um, pertaining to the industrialization. So first, this works restructuring process was bumpy. Infrastructure-led development was there already. And second, um, do, um, from both secondary uh, um, 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 research and my attempt um, to connect to um, key actors in both China and within the corporations that um, initially um, drove these uh, transcontinental rail connection, um, we could establish that, that the connection was driven initially by um, Hewlett Packard. All right, who uh, which has um strong operations within China, and um it actually um can be traced to one particular key actor within um Hewlett Packard, and um and he was a uh, very instrumental in trying to propose this transcontinental rail project, and this all happened um uh, in the eight uh, about two thousand and eight two thousand and nine, um which was um four years before the Belt and Road um initiative was launched, and um. He then proposed this um, to the Chongqing city government um, because um, Chongqing being in interior China, it, it had huge trouble um, attracting uh, um, industries to relocate into the interior um, part because of trans uh, lack of connectivity. So connectivity is a central uh, theme right here. And so Hewlett Packard said, well, I mean, if you want to uh, have us in, um, you know, in central China, then we must have a way that um, we can transport our final um, products out of um, the city in a way that doesn't have to uh, be transported back to um, the coastal cities and then back and then onto the ships uh, and then um, go through the maritime um, routes. So 
um, they proposed these. Uh, the Chongqing government was very interested in these, and then they tried to push it to um, the Chinese um, central government. And so the entire process was developed at um, the subnational level through the interaction between Hewlett Packard and um, the Chongqing city government, then as uh, elevated to um, the national um, level. And um, gradually, um, the transcontinental um, rail connections uh, were formed after um, the national governments were able to um, agree on um, a customs arrangement that um, enabled trains to move through um, um, borders without um, and, uh, having to be checked um, thoroughly. So together with these developments, all right, industrial restructuring, developments within China and um, by a transnational uh, corporation operating within China, seeking new um, connectivity to uh, markets, right? So uh, Hewlett Packard, Chongqing government, the emergence of logistics, right? Duisburg is the world's largest Indian port, took place in tandem with regular protests from steel makers suffering from um, the industrialization. So these um, entire uh, um, um, process of um, connecting with um, China all right, actually take, um, took place within this um, very nuanced um, background of um, both attempts at path creation, which is to um, um, establish new connections and connectivities with um, major markets, and in this case, China, right? And also path dependence in which um, steel making um, in Duisburg is uh, um, far from going away. It is still a very major um, city, although maybe not of the significance um, as it was um, previously but um, there is a very um, nuanced uh, um, picture um, at play. So, um, you know, in this regard, um, we cannot say that um, infrastructure-led um, development um, has been um, very um, successful in, um, in terms of um, lifting um, the city, uh, you know, in terms of uh, driving sharp growth. Having said this, all right, the um, rail connection uh, has, um, been um, generating two degrees of um, impacts that are very positive, and this um, explains why Duisburg uh, appeared um, in, in the news over the past three to four years, and why the Guardian um, newspaper, um, in its interview with key leaders um, in Duisburg, were able to, um, or rather the key Duisburg uh, leaders in um, the, uh, shared um, their, their views um, with um, the Guardian newspaper that um, um, Duisburg gradually, because of this connection, it has actually generated new um, um, uh, impetuses for growth um, to the extent that it is, um, you know, I mean, in terms of informally, it has become um, Germany's China city, China city in terms of like, you know, becoming a hub for connection with China. So the real connection um, from our research, um, it offered um, two degrees of impact. One is the most direct impact. First, uh, on the logistics sector, which is booming, right? And uh, we um, 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 spoke with um, one of, uh, we spoke with these um, uh, main um, actor, the head of international development at the Duisburg Intermodal um, Terminal, um, Emily um, X. Lieben. And um, she said that, you know, they are at um, um, capacity and they are just struggling um, to lease, um, uh, to, to get um, extra space um, for um, the logistics uh, um, demands um, that uh, are emerging from um, this transcontinental rail connection. And um, overall, there are now uh, more than 50,000 um, trips already, um, based on my last um, check two weeks ago um, on the statistics um, um, from China, so 50,000 trips emerging from China uh, um, into um, the European um, Union. So um, the logistics sector within um, Duisburg is booming and um, it is now, um, there is now uh, at the micro level um, um, talk about um, whether um, the existing capacity is able to cope with, uh, with demand if demand keeps um, increasing. So it is very positive for the sector and more broadly, and this is something that I would like to investigate um, subsequently, is that um, because of the Belt and Road um, subsidies, um, uh, or rather, maybe I can speak a bit more about this, these trips in general enjoy uh, degree, uh, subsidies from the Chinese state because um, um, it is um, generally initially export oriented. That is, um, it is usually is meant to um, bring goods into um, the European Union. Gradually, uh, usually the, uh, the return trips are way um, lower, right? But now um, it is increasing 
and it is increasing because all right, there are more um, Chinese investors now establishing firms in Duisburg with the primary aim of transporting goods um, from Europe to China um, through the railway. So um, I'm very interested in the extent to which um, um, the companies that are participating in these uh, um, um, new opportunity to um, sell products from Europe um, to China via the railway. Are they only exclusively from China or are European firms also jumping on this um, opportunity? So um, again, um, when I checked um, the statistics uh, for these um, impact, um, initially the degree uh, of uh, return or rather the extent of uh, return trips were less than 50% um, when we uh, first started the field work in, in 2017 and 2018. Um, now, um, last year's um, statistics, all right, the return uh, um, percentage, um, the overall uh, return percentage um, is now um, uh, more than 80%. So out of 10 trains that come out from China, eight trains will return with um, uh, full um, cargoes. So there is a rising number of Chinese investors here. Duisburg has become a hub in another sense. And in this sense, it is quite interesting in that the, the conditions that it developed um, through infrastructure-led development as a result of economic restructuring, now became becomes the platform right to connect um, Duisburg um, with um, the Chinese markets. And as a result, um, there are um, um, rising numbers of Chinese investors um, in the city. So what I'm very interested um, in um, further examining and which um, we have um, begun preliminary um, secondary uh, uh, expo uh, exploration of secondary data is um, what is this um, impact here um, with um, Chinese investors um, within um, Duisburg? So really looking at the urban and um, the regional um, level on the, on the rural um, region. So this in a way speaks to the Belt and Road Initiative, right? But then because the Transcontinental Railway preceded that, and the Belt and Road Initiative is more than just the railway, but it has now become a major enabler of the railway. It presents a very interesting picture where um, these, the development may or may not be directly attributed to the Belt and Road Initiative, even though the train trips uh, enjoy subsidies coming out from the Belt and Road Initiative um, um, funds. So with these, I conclude um, by um, raising two further research questions that, you know, um, hopefully we, uh, we can open this up to the floor. And first, that is how is Duisburg transformed endogenously? So is there any kind of endogenous development um, through deepening engagements with China? So here we, I, um, I'm trying to uh, raise this question in terms of um, the deepening our understanding of the effects of infrastructure-led development and um, whether it truly promises um, endogenous um, changes in a very transformative level. So is there a buildup of um, skilled labor, for instance, entrepreneurs, right, more uh, business-like um, people coming in Duisburg and creating an environment which then um, with the uh, aim of um, um, driving new networks to connect with um, the consumer market in China and also um, have um, has Duisburg um, attracted more um, investors, right? These are all key um, parameters, right, that um, were established even before um, the connection with um, China. So we've um, looked at a few uh, policy reports and, um, you know, skilled labor, attracting skilled labor entrepreneurs and, um, and investors have been identified as a problem even um, in the in, in the mid 2000s. So in spite of Duisburg's um, success in logistics, right, having um, skilled labor and entrepreneurs and investors coming into the city um, remained a, a major problem. In fact, depopulation um, was a major issue for um, many years. So, um, um, you know, with the railway, the broader question now, all right, beyond the uh, celebration of initial success is whether there is truly transformative endogenous um, um, driven growth. Second, all right, what makes the Duisburg um, experience unapplicable to other contexts? Right, I think um, this uh, is something that will be potentially interesting um, from a comparative um, angle, because if you, if you look at the historical um, conditions that enable Duisburg to connect um, with um, um, China, and if you take a conjunctural um, angle, which we look at, you know, at a specific moment, Hewlett Packard came up with this strategy, the Chongqing government, everything aligned very nicely together in, the, in, in joining up um, this um, transcontinental uh, connection. Does this then mean that, um, you know, infrastructure-led development with 
in a particular place has to be really considered as such and may potentially not be applicable to other contexts. Right. Thank you very much for um, um, being here with me, and I look forward to um, hearing your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Keen, for your input and working on this example in Duisburg. Once again, we'll take uh, one or two questions of clarification, short questions, before we go to our final presentation. There's one in the audience here. Yes, so thank you very much for the presentation. I was wondering, uh, on one of your pictures, there was like the one where uh, Xi Jinping and other representatives were um, in Duisburg, I think. And, uh, there was Orban on the picture. And I was just wondering, because this transcontinental railway goes another route. Now it goes the Russian, Belarus, uh, Poland route. So what is the reason why, I know that Orban is very involved in Silk Road investment projects, but why was he on this particular picture, which was after all a celebration picture or a railway that would not go through Hungary? Um. To be very honest, um, I do not know why he was um, in the group. That's a, a fantastic uh, a question in the sense that decision-making dynamics and who are the key actors that were involved uh, in these um, to be participants um, in these uh, celebratory ceremony. So um, my broader um, understanding here was that um, Dewey's port um, played a very um, important um, role in terms of um, also um, driving, um, you know, the, 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 the connection. So they saw an opportunity. So there were um, several other reasons that enabled um, Duisport to, to scale this up um, to um, the national um, level. But I um, do not know the reasons why specific actors were, um, to, were chosen to attend that um, particular um, ceremony. Um, Although it does really raise a very important question on um, the Duisburg side and within Germany. So what were some of the considerations that then led to um, Germany um, being um, uh, an active participant um, in this um, process? Right. So um, my understanding was um, from the interview that um, the key actor from Hewlett Packard gave was um, Hewlett Packard was very um, 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 proactive in that, but then they have to scale it up to the national um, level. So the Chinese national government would then have to collab um, to the to, um, to liars with um, the other um, uh, national governments. But still, I am able to answer the question in that I do not know why these um, actors were there uh, in terms of like, you know, why are there not other actors, but um, presumably they played a very important role. And I can see that, you know, um, you know, there are um, actors of different um, rankings and uh, positions at a different scale. It's still a great question in the, in the sense that it highlights the fact that um, the dynamics of um, involvement and um, how this actually came about um, within Duisburg, I'm not sure if it's been studied within the German um, um, speaking um, academic world, but um, I, I'm, I'm really keen to understand how this process um, came about. So it, it's a fantastic question. So thank you. It's certainly worth being followed further in detail. Did you want to, to add briefly or is it done by this comment? Yeah, it's done. There is no Orban on the picture. <laughs> Confirm this. This guy does look like Orban, but it's not Orban. <laughs> At least one thing clarified for today in this panel. Uh, let's go on. Uh, thanks, Keen, once again for your input. Uh, thanks for taking further questions for your further research and others. Um, I would like to uh, give the floor now to Andy. Andy Pike is a leading scholar of local and regional development. Uh, he has been uh, quite influential with his book on infrastructure-led development and uh, raising issues and questions of financialization. And we are very interested and keen to hear uh, your thoughts on new research directions in the geographical political economy of Chinese global infrastructural investments beyond Belt and Road. Andy, the floor is yours. Yeah, thanks very much. Uh Tilo and uh, Leila and the organizers of the conference uh, for pulling together such a, a great session um, and for the participants online and in the room, uh, some great questions and ideas, I think, which are, uh, are very useful for our ongoing collaboration in this area. 
this contribution is slightly different from the preceding papers in being um, more of a kind of a synoptic paper where uh, as part of our collaboration with um, Tilo, Leila, Keen, and, and others, uh, we've been trying to, uh, Giles Moen as well at the Open University, we've been trying to kind of, I think, look across work in, uh, in, um, in geography and political science and planning uh, that's been trying to address uh, Chinese global uh, infrastructural investments um, with a view to trying to sort of understand where the issues are and where the new research directions are emerging and part of this has been um, through collaboration and seeking funding to actually do some empirical work but this contribution then tries to I think identify a number of directions which um, connect with the lots of uh, lots of things that have been said already today uh, and, and points very well made by uh, Leila, Margot and, and, and Keen. Uh, so you know again we're we're kind of connecting into the broader discussion, um, you know, the geopolitical, the geoeconomic tensions that have emerged from uh, China's economic rise and also its um, interest in infrastructure investments uh, globally, uh, as these couple of uh, newspaper headlines then, uh, particularly focused on the German context. And we've had issues of this kind in the uh, UK, US and, and um, internationally, Giles Moen, who we've been working with, has been addressing this in Africa uh, for many years. So what we've tried to do, as I say, is to look more broadly uh, to try and argue that uh, we need to move in some ways beyond the Belt and Road Initiative then to try and identify where the future directions are for research uh, are in this area. Um, and there is a draft paper that we've been working on, which we'd be happy to share, I'm sure, with people to get their thoughts and comments. Um, but that's the substance of the contribution today. So slightly different from the more empirically rich discussions uh, and analyses that, um, that have preceded it. So basically, uh, in summary, there's four areas we, we feel where research um, needs to go. And I'll just um, highlight these now, and then we'll say a little bit more in terms of the, uh, the substance of these. The first one, uh, we think it's time in a way to kind of go beyond uh, the BRI uh, as the central focus of Chinese uh, infrastructure investments and to give a little bit more uh, kind of, I suppose, scope to uh, a much more complex and evolving uh, picture of geoeconomic and geopolitical uh, shifts and changes. So that's the first one. The second one, we also want to try and move a little bit beyond um, what we see as very nation state centric, almost monolithic conceptions of China and the Chinese state. Thirdly, and again, this has been picked up uh, wonderfully by um, uh, particularly Leila and Kane's presentations on the uh, subnational analytical scale. So trying to recover that, to insert that into these much more multi-actor and multi-level uh, analyses. And then lastly, we want to try and suggest that um, this doesn't perhaps sketch out um, an easy research terrain. You know, it's a lot more complex. It's a lot more diverse. So we need some conceptual and theoretical frameworks to help us make sense, to interpret and to explain uh, what's going on. So those are our four uh, kind of key directions. And as this is kind of work in progress, we'd be very interested in your, your feedback on these. So let's just flesh those, uh, those points out a, a little bit further before we get into the wider discussion. So the first one uh, is this idea of trying to uh, move in the direction of interpreting uh, the shifting geoeconomics, geopolitics then, but trying to move beyond in some ways um, the Belt and Road Initiative. And this is not about discarding it. Uh, it's obviously still an important entity. It's shaped a lot of China uh, infrastructure investments now in Europe and beyond uh, to date. But we would argue that a lot of the work that's been done on this uh, tends to give a, a quite broad, perhaps in some work, overly coherent understanding then of the BRI as this kind of master strategy, if you like, that's been rolled out in an unproblematic way um, uh, by China and Chinese actors. Uh, and what we're trying to call for in this is really trying to understand how Chinese infrastructure investments then are certainly intertwined uh, often uh, with BRI, but they also extend beyond it now. Um, so the BRI can be part of a future research agenda, obviously, uh, but we need to recognise that there's a need to look in a broader uh, fashion to try and understand how and where the uh, BRI is, is um, perhaps 
extending in some ways, but also perhaps being surpassed, being kind of um, deflected, you know, given the controversy in some national uh, settings where BRI has been seen as problematic by certain actors. So then perhaps Chinese infrastructure actors, investors are looking for other ways in that maybe downplay BRI uh, as part of the broader agenda. Uh, Margot did a wonderful job of uh, talking about the new kind of uh, landscape of interurban connectivity that has uh, been very much part of uh, Seth Schindler and colleagues' arguments about the new Cold War and the way in which that is kind of animating these, um, uh, these broader discussion, uh, discussions. Uh, economic nationalisms, populisms, uh, we thought were part of the um, mark of this. We're now actually seeing actual conflict between states. Um, which again are going to be causing uh, ripples and ramifications uh, in geoeconomics and geopolitics um, uh, across the piece. So again, this is shifting and changing and the context, the setting uh, within which we can actually talk about uh, China's infrastructure investments. And again, for future research, we think that's a key part of what needs to be done. Leila did a wonderful job of, of making the argument uh, for multi-actor, multi-scalar hybridizing strategies. Uh, and again, trying to move beyond uh, BRI, we would argue that these become ever more important in terms of trying to understand, again, this complex, diverse landscape. We'll come back to that in a moment. Uh, but crucially, the way in which you've got these multiple actors working at multiple scales uh, and often having these kind of very hybrid type of, uh, uh, of strategies that are being put in place and adapted to particular uh, local conditions. And uh, Keynes uh, and colleagues work on uh, Duisburg is fantastic in showing the uh, complexity and diversity of how these things are put together and how they evolve over time. So that's the first one, trying to uh, look a little bit beyond uh, BRI and, and the shifting geoeconomic and geopolitical uh, context within which um, these Chinese infrastructure investments are taking place. The second one, and we think this um, is really important in terms of uh, trying to understand better, I suppose, what we mean by China. You know, it's often a, a kind of box that sometimes wheeled out uh, in explanatory terms. Um, but we feel that, again, future research is going to need to uh, be much more nuanced, much more sophisticated in trying to break up, uh, break open a, a very simple nation state centric uh, understandings of what China is all about. Existing work, we would argue, has been uh, quite unified and to develop these uh, somewhat monolithic understandings of the Chinese state, uh, which is actually a, you know, quite a particular uh, state form, uh, for sure, a particular kind of authoritarian capitalism, as it's been uh, uh, described. And, and here we're kind of taking inspiration from uh, work by the likes of Bob Jessup and others, um, where we're trying to think about uh, how we theorise in the state. Um, and for us, um, it's important to try and understand how that state is, is constantly in a process of being remade uh, by multiple actors. They try to cohere and stabilise structures, devise, sustain, implement imaginaries like BRI strategies and projects. You know, this is an unstable kind of fluid uh, state in motion. Uh, and we think that conception can be quite helpful in terms of addressing China, you know, and kind of opening up the, uh, uh, the box to better understand the sort of rivalrous, contested, um, you know, relationships then between the state, state-owned enterprises and, and so on, um, banks and, and, and whatnot. So that, that kind of nexus, if you like, of Chinese state power that backs up investors in infrastructure across the piece, then we want to kind of give more attention to that and problematize some of the relationships and the ways in which those are, are brought together. And that then for us opens the frame a little broader then to take in state, non-state and hybrid actors. And again, not a simple task, of course, uh, tracing, mapping, explaining the agency of these actors. But crucially, we feel it's important to try and uh, address in future research directions. So that's our second one, trying to move beyond these state centric conceptions of, of China and simplistic monolithic notions of the, the Chinese state. Our third one, and again, this has been uh, ably demonstrated by uh, Leila and uh, Keane today, uh, is the idea of recovering the subnational analytical scale. And, uh, again, we feel a lot of the work that's been done so far has been transnational with this BRI focus, but also very much about a China nation state sort of set of relationships. And uh, we feel in many cases that uh, it's not exclusively the case, but in many cases, there's been uh, a, an overlooked um, 
kind of sense that local regional urban urban dimensions if you like the subnational space if you like of these infrastructure investments has received some attention and some great work out there um uh, keen and layla's uh, examples today are, are good examples of that um but this idea of trying to understand how uh, infrastructure investments and you know we would include chinese and other hybrids uh, multiple international investor um funded and financed them um, in uh, projects and initiatives then are grounded in places uh, and trying to kind of unravel and uh, tease out the way in which you've got multiple interconnected actors with different relations and geographical scales then and how these things are negotiated contested and implemented and again we've uh, we've seen some really nice uh, and rich uh, discussions of that in Layla and Keane's uh, presentations this morning so our third one is that exactly that point we need to recover and try and pay more attention and build up our stock of knowledge and understanding and our explanations then of how that analytical scale works at the subnational uh, level. And that's not to the exclusion, obviously, of nation states and the tra transnational linkages. As, as Margot explained, those are extremely important um, in a multi-level, multi-actor understanding of the uh, kind of um, uh, framework of thinking that we're interested in, in, in developing. And our last one, uh, because again, we're you know, typical academic, I suppose, in a way, but uh, trying to um, sketch out a, a more nuanced and sophisticated uh, set of research directions that uh, moves in the direction of more complexity, more diversity. So again, we challenge ourselves as critical social scientists to then say, okay, that's fine. We can understand there's more complexity and diversity, but how do we grasp it? How do we analyze it? How do we try and understand and explain it in coherent ways that goes beyond um, creating a, a unique and particular explanations for each and every individual case? You know, we still want concepts and theories to try and compare, contrast, to look at similarities and continuities as well as difference and diversity. And again, what we argue here, and again, we see this as a very important future research direction is uh, trying to develop conceptions then that uh, see multiple actors, relations and settings and different scales. And these, these we feel are the ways in which we can better cope with uh, diversity and novelty, as well as issues around continuity and, uh, and similarity. And I think as Key mentioned, uh, Jamie Peck and others ideas around conjunctural theorizing um, can be quite helpful here in terms of trying to recognize the different geographies and temporalities at play. Um, so in a way, trying to recognize that there are resemblances or common or general features that we can see in different Chinese infrastructure investment cases, but also recognizing that these are married often with very particular, uh, perhaps in some cases, even unique, one of a kind type things in certain settings, but we need to bring the two of those things together to really explain and understand uh, the cases that we're addressing. And we've been in the early stages, I think, of trying to uh, develop this idea of variegated infrastructural landscapes that in a sense are um, you know, to a degree coherent, but they're also kind of work in progress. They're things that are in motion, they're evolving, changing over time, and they involve these multiple relations then between actors working at different scales. So we're at the early stages of uh, kind of trying to define and specify what we mean by this, but we feel there might be some promise in, uh, in this uh, marrying together the ideas of conjunctural theorizing with this notion of variegated infrastructural landscapes. And we'd also, and I think this is a point has been made to uh, stress the importance of comparative international work and part of our collaboration has really been focused on trying to do some of this and to get some resources to do some empirical work to really challenge and test some of these conceptual ideas, both in the global north and, uh, and global south uh, more broadly. So I'll leave it there. Uh, thanks, uh, Thilo. That's just our four directions then basically to try and uh, move things forward for um, work on Chinese infrastructure investment. So thanks very much. Thank you very much, Andy, for sharing these points with us. Um, again, I would ask for short questions of clarification, either in the chat or in the room. If this is not the case, we can immediately jump uh, to the general discussion. And I would just like to try and uh, connect the presentations that we had to uh, the overall topic of this annual conference. Maybe one thing to stress is what, what is actually our motivation to look into this topic of China activities 
uh, in infrastructures. So what, what is the big issue behind? And uh, I think it's, it's clearly related to this question uh, of China being the, the new big global power, um, becoming stronger economically, playing out its originally economic power uh, with a particular now changing global division of labor. Um, with also infrastructure projects and uh, kind of multiplying its position um, with a maybe grand strategy. So we pointed this out in the panel that it might not be that grand strategy thing that it's portrayed, but certainly there is a logic behind. So China, with all its various uh, actors at different scales, is reshaping uh, the global economic and political order, or maybe as a question, to what extent is this order reshaping? Um, the second observation is that, um, first of all, infrastructure-led development was seen as a strategy to uh, facilitate um, wider economic integration at a global scale maybe also creating this new world order uh, through Chinese investments. But this now coincides with uh, raising awareness of the increasing fragility of these systems. Um, also Keen made it clear that when we look at the corridor where uh, this kind of land link between China and EU uh, is passing by, um, a lot can happen on, on this long way. If, if there is a war, then infrastructure connection is broken. Um, we have again discussions with uh, the lockdowns in Shanghai and Beijing um, of um, um, production chains being interrupted. Uh, we already have uh, week long queues in the big harbors worldwide. Um, so this fragility of infrastructural connections and systems um, is now actually the new question. And instead of uh, promoting further economic integration at the global scale, these new infrastructural systems are rather um, slowing down economic globalization. And overall, with the geopolitical tensions that we're seeing, uh, this Rise of, uh, rise of the question of the new Cold War linked to these investments. Connecting this to the question of the conference, uh, I think that's worth to discuss to what extent we can see uh, a, a massive change uh, in the global condition. So far, and linking in uh, Margaret's presentation, uh, the EU mainly intervened in terms of regulation. So I'm not saying regulation is bad, but it's very late that uh, the Europeans came up uh, with a real investment uh, pot to counterbalance uh, the influence coming from the East. And I would like to link this to the question, if we did take um, these infrastructure-led globalization projects seriously enough in the past years? Or did we kind of overlook the geopolitical power which is inscribed in this kind of projects? That's my kind of attempt to try and, and unite uh, the panel presentations. And uh, if you want, we can try and get some, some uh, impressions of the panelists first and then get in more questions and uh, positions, statements uh, from the online and physical audience here in the conference room. I think that at the very beginning, uh, around uh, 2013 and before, um, the European Commission, or the, <laughs> the uh, governments of countries in Europe, uh, were very much uh, eager to have Chinese investment because there was a real need for infrastructure investment in certain regions and uh, the funding was not available through the EU. And so this is a fact. And the second fact was that at that moment, 2013, um, the EU was had tried before to set up a funding for connecting 
um, Central Asia with Europe, but uh, this didn't work out. So there are two problems at that time. So, and also um, we very much thought that we could uh, cooperate with China on our own uh, uh, rules and regulation. And we did not uh, expect China to have such a sort of grand strategy, but I don't think that they really had a grand strategy because it took them until 2015 to have the initial, um, um, what is it, the uh, former, um, the National Reform and Development Commission. This was a formal, uh, the former um, um, planning commission. And it took them until 2015 to have a first outline of this uh, strategy. So they started earlier and it took them a few years. And then they continuously adapted this kind of strategy. And they really, I think they listened to what the critics was. And I think in the long run, without cooperation from Europe and other countries, uh, these ideas of connecting Asia and Europe will not work out. So uh, I think there are so many challenges for China itself. Uh, especially with this war and uh, uh, challenging the um, connect the railway connection between uh, Central uh, Central Asia and uh, Europe, they have to think about new I new roads and uh, new partners. And I don't know if they really have uh, uh, want only to rely on Russia. Maybe they they have to think about new uh, approaches to that. Keen, would you like to go next? Uh, because also in, in your presentation, like uh, going back to this picture with uh, not with Orban, uh, it's, it's been portrayed like as a joint project uh, at eye level. And uh, I think we now know it's not at eye level, but was, was it meant to be at eye level or was it an illusion? No, I, I, I think, you know, that um, became... Um, heavily publicized, um, at least um, from the um, China context, I think it is very um, logical um, um, for um, CE to celebrate this as if it is part of the Belt and Road Initiative because um, that um, picture was taken only about um, less than five months after the Belt and Road Initiative was initially launched. So I don't think there was any concrete blueprint at the time. So, you know, it's more like <coughs> celebrating what um, was already uh, established um, over the course of the past um, three to four um, years. But um, those um, key actors, um, notwithstanding, obviously, I mean, it, there, there's the minister at the ministerial level and uh, also uh, at the local level. So it reflects um, <coughs> in some ways a, 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 real, a, a truly multi-scalar um, um, arrangement. Um, but there are more specific uh, empirical um, nuances to um, what actually happened that triggered um, these uh, um, entire event to happen. And I think it goes back to um, um, Thilo's um, earlier question on the broader significance of what does Chinese um, investments mean um, to Europe? <coughs> and um, excuse me. And what we found empirically, if I could add, I mean, so um, excuse me, could be my, um, I would have to turn this um, page off. Yeah. So what we found um, was that um, actually within um, Germany for this part, based on what they said, um, they actually wanted more strategic um, flexibility and they did not want to be a, an administrative um, port. So they, um, when they, um, you know, the, the financing of um, their facilities um, through EU funds were um, gradually paid back, um, they wanted to look for new growth channels. Uh, and um, they wanted more flexibility in order to um, become um, successful. So that was, um, uh, I can um, read um, a quote here um, from um, the managing director um, at um, Dewey Sport, and that's national funds for terminals are provided rather sporadically. All right, it is not an option for us to wait for funding from national or European institutions in order to advance on projects. So support is granted very slowly and infrequently as a means of fueling and kicking off projects it is not to assure long-term financing. So what they want um, is something um, of a longer-term um, growth. And um, it does appear that this opportunity um, to um, connect um, with China um, came along, I mean, uh, connect in a more formal way um, through the Transcontinental Railway came along and that was then identified as a potential growth um, prospect. And um, 
in, in many ways, it um, built on um, what they already were trying to do, and that was to reduce um, dependency on um, um, the EU and um, you know, um, the, the associated conditions that um, came along with um, the use of um, EU um, funds. So this gives another um, perspective. It obviously is not all encompassing and doesn't explain fully why Duisburg was selected. Uh, as I said, I think this is a very interesting research question that demands further uh, um, exploration. But from what we found, all right, it, um, and this is, I think, the, the advantage of taking that particular conjunctural approach in that, you know, they have their particular concerns and uh, agenda. And once we um, bring this up uh, onto the table and then we look at the opportunities that came from um, China, that interacted at that particular point in time after um, the 2008 financial crisis in order to, um, um, right, with the aim of driving um, growth, um, you know, for um, Dewey's port. So these... Um, this was maybe um, at a time, um, you know, viewed more like a, a, an emerging opportunity. There was no Belt and Road um, initiative. The first um, train um, ran in 2011. So two, two, two and a half years before the Belt and Road initiative was even officially launched, not to mention like, you know, roll out of more concrete policies. So there were actually more grounded and specific um, um, arrangements. And initially, one other detail that I didn't mention in um, the presentation um, is that the original arrangements between um, China and um, Duisburg was um, proprietary train services exclusive only to Hewlett Packard. So gradually, Hewlett Packard decided to uh, to open up these routes in order to um, attain more cost efficiency. So if um, even their competitors jump onto the freight service, right, they will be able to share the costs, and um, it actually works well for um, the, the Chinese local government as well. They were all trying to um, attract um, note notebook uh, manufacturing uh, uh, so, um, firms into central China. So um, so initially, it was just a very small scale. Uh, um, arrangement between Hewlett Packard, the, the central Chinese government, uh, um, municipal government, with Chongqing and and Duisburg, right? And later on, because of the Belt and Road Initiative, um, I, I think it's taken up to another level, and this explains in part why um, the Chinese president chose to visit um, Duisburg. So, it is a very interesting um, angle to explore what so-called Chinese investments mean to um, your uh, subnational regions, and it foregrounds that there are specific contextual reasons uh, and impetuses that um, enable these um, connections all to come together. And what is even more interesting is this came before the BRI and subsequently became the platform for enhancing and expanding connections on the basis of the BRI and um, um, the, 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 the broader, more extensive map that I showed, um, you know, uh, demonstrates the extent to which now with BRI funding support, Right, the proliferation of the network has become uh, unrecognizable from the original arrangement between Central China and um, Duisburg. Thank you. Thanks, Keen. Andy, when we are talking about infrastructure-led development, should, should we not rather talk about infrastructure-led geopolitics? And were we too short in the past years in recognizing these wider impacts? What, what do you think? How, how did this uh, uh, grand infrastructural strategies uh, reshape our imaginations of globalization? Yeah, I mean, um, I think um, probably the, the kind of economics of infrastructure-led development and how that linked particularly to urban development probably became the, the main focus of activity. Uh, I think as, as um, as several of the speakers and the questions have got at a little bit, that there's some massive kind of underinvestment legacy in infrastructure development and renewal uh, internationally. Uh, so I think many states were were really really focused on how do you fund and finance that infrastructure renewal and development, and a lot of the work that we've done in the, the financializing city statecraft and infrastructure book was looking at particularly how the UK was going about engaging with a whole series of other international actors. Uh, public, private, civic, sovereign wealth funds, um, other states, state-owned enterprises, uh, you know, insurance companies, um, and so on and so forth. So I think that that perhaps um, kind of uh, that economic financial focus perhaps uh, made them miss a little bit of these kind of geoeconomic and geopolitical dimensions, Tilo, as, uh, as you're suggesting. And uh, I think that would 
that would be the case. The idea that there was such a great need for infrastructure finance uh, led them into relationships that they've now kind of almost paused and reflected on and even reversed out of in many cases. Um, uh, uh, in the UK, for example, um, you know, Huawei were in, uh, meant to be involved in um, uh, in rolling out 5G, uh, the broadband um, network in the UK. They'd already been involved in 4G and the UK government was signed up to doing this, but under US pressure, then they kind of uh, ejected Huawei effectively from the new infrastructure renewal. So it's almost, uh, you know, in a sense, Tilo, the revenge of geoeconomics and geopolitics, you know, these things have come roaring back into the picture, I think, for many states when actually what they wanted to do was just focus singly on the economic, the financial arguments and cases for getting investment from anywhere, from anybody. We don't, we don't care whose money it is. Uh, we just need that investment in our infrastructure. So I think they've had a almost a rude awakening in some ways um, that these geoeconomic and geopolitical dimensions that perhaps were always there, but they didn't want to talk about them. They ignored them. They submerged them. They didn't want to engage with these difficult, uh, thorny questions about how do you, uh, how do you treat uh, infrastructure investment then from um, more authoritarian states that have um, uh, particular agendas in terms of why they're why they're investing in your infrastructure. So I think you're right. It's a very good point, uh, Tilo. Um, it's a the revenge of geoeconomics and geopolitics. It's come back with a with a bite. The title for the next paper. Leila, your thoughts before we collect the final round of questions. Thanks, Tilo, and to, to all of the participants. Do you hear me? Oh, okay. Um, I was just thinking that across our papers and the discussion, it's emerging as the key, like two key questions in a way are emerging, or perhaps now three with also the revenge of geo, uh, geoeconomics. Um, and this is like, really, can everybody, can all places get the territory right? Um, and this, returns us over and over back to the uneven um, spatial development question, right? And how Chinese investments feed into it. Um, and the next one, what does such a development really mean? And this was most aptly articulated by Keen that, okay, we can say that some places get the territory right and tap into the large uh, connectivity infrastructure developments, uh, but what does it mean for um, local labor relations, local civil societies, uh, overturn developmental uh, perspectives of cities, uh, city regions, uh, and so on, right? Um, and in that sense, th then the next questions come with currently understood geopolitical tensions and with Europe trying to step up. And in a way for me, this is a question more to Margot and all of you, because I don't know how to think of this uh, myself whether what Europe and US now are trying to come up with, whether this is changing the terms um, in terms of thinking of more even development, offering really different kinds of tools for infrastructure renewal, uh, thinking of dependencies also as coming from uh, more and more in, more and more financialization as Andy has uh, worked um, on extensively and more and more engagement of um, international private investors without looking where do they come from, right? Uh, and whether this, whether in a way, I mean, for me, the question is like whether the West will be looking into uh, more publicly funded, less uh, privately driven um, investments for providing essential infrastructures rather or uh, social infrastructures rather than continuously trying to tap into profitable large scale uh, transnational connectivity infrastructures. So my question is in a way like at this conjuncture, whether um, the West will be coming back with more of the same or something different. And at least in my imaginary, something different um, needs to refocus on uh, spatially uneven consequences of uh, the infrastructure led development that has been taking uh, place in the past decade. Uh, but I don't know if that's, um, kept in mind uh, by the new initiatives? Well, what the West certainly has changed or has realized is that uh, this idea uh, also reported from Keen to get the territory right 
So to perceive infrastructural development as a territorial question, so this has clearly failed or has been a, a, a misconception, this assumption that larger scale ter uh, infrastructural developments can be treated as a territorial issue. So I think we're now at the point to realize that uh, these investments ought to be seen as geoeconomic and uh, geopolitical questions. And uh, this raises a whole lot of, of further questions as, as you just did, Lila. But I would like to look into the audience here in the room once again, and also motivate uh, online participants um, Keen will have to leave for teaching, so maybe the very last chance to pose a question to Keen that can be answered in one minute. Elizabeth, once again, uh, feel free to speak directly. I think our technical staff can give you the right to talk. Yes, thanks. Hey, thank you very much. Uh, so my question is, uh, you are all talking about subnational actors. Um, uh, and so, or sub-state actors and the importance to study those. Uh, but I, I did not see much of it in your talks. Uh, so uh, kind of in, in terms of concrete examples, especially from the Chinese side, of course, I saw D Duisburg um, as a city that's a subnational actors, but I'm interested in the Chinese uh, side. So what are your sources? What is the access? Thank you. Maybe Keen first and then Leila. Yes. Um, thank you for um, thank you, Elizabeth, for the question. Um, yeah, I, I um, yeah, in, in the Chinese case, um, official um, official uh, proclamations I um, are, are taken from um, Chinese language uh, publications. Um, they have um, provided many um, interviews on the logics of um, <coughs> excuse me the transcontinental railway. Um, with regard to um, the Hewlett Packard actor, um, we um, contacted him and um, he was actually previously with Foxconn, so as a very rich, um, uh, or rather a, 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 an actor with a lot of um, re, um, um, experience in the, in, in the particular project. And, um, <coughs> excuse me, more um, specifically, uh, and this remains ongoing with regard to actors in Hewlett Packard and actors in um, the notebook um, production um, uh, agglomeration, um, you know, that the central Chinese government was trying to um, attract into in, in China. I, we have um, links to uh, the primary consulting group working for the Belt and Road um, Initiative in China, and they are based in um, Beijing. So, um, these uh, actors are able to um, speak to um, government planners and provide um, insights. So they are all um, consultants and they have um, provided input. Obviously, e essentially the um, people who draw um, the policy or uh, write the policies and draw the blueprint, they are in the government bureaucracy. So we didn't speak to them directly, but we um, are able to access um, the next level, which is the people who are working directly um, with these um, bureaucrats and provided um, inputs into um, this uh, 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 project. So in, in my case, I mean, for um, the Transcontinental Railway, um, the mayor of um, the municipality is obviously very difficult to access directly from uh, as a researcher from our from our end um, but because they speak to the office that we communicate with I mean so the, the office that is now working on the Bell and Root cons cons consultancy uh, um, projects so he actually communicated with them so through my um, interaction with um, these uh, group of consultants I could um, verify a lot of um, points that are published um, in the secondary um, resources. So clearly there are some people we can't hear directly from their, um, fr from them because it's just difficult to access the government, especially high ranking government officials, but um, in some ways because of our um, um, academic connections and the fact that these consultants um, also are very keen to um, publish. I mean, so part of their job is also to publish um, academic um, papers. They're usually based in universities. Um, we have been able to verify a lot of um, uh, processes that are happening at the subnational level in China. Leila, do you want to add anything uh, from your case? Um, what I wanted to add, but I mean, Keen is bigger of, a, of an expert on this, obviously, um, is that in, in our paper, there is not so much about divergence 
uh, from the side of Chinese actors. Uh, but what we do know from the literature is that actually in past years, China has been, or Chinese actors have, like su Chinese subnational actors have become particularly active in terms of economic diplomacy with European also subnational actors. So you have more and more of these um, direct partnerships conducted on the level of cities or regions. And, but what we don't have at this point is the understanding of diversity. And I think this is what Andy was trying to uh, communicate um, in, in, in his presentation very uh, clearly that we need to understand that diversity instead of assuming as it is now that all Chinese regions and different subnational authorities or different private companies based in China, that they all operate under one scheme. Um, this, is, this can be a very misleading approach. And in the sense, this is really the research gap that we need to be addressing instead of assuming to, thanks Kane again, instead of assuming to actually look into this carefully. Uh, because what we know from uh, research, not like this is not in European case, but what we know from research on China in itself, uh, is that these actors are not always aligning. There are contradictory, conflictual interests, and we have to understand those interests to then understand how it plays out in relation to uh, European uh, spaces and subnational uh, levels. And they wanted to end. Thank you, Leila, and also to clean. Uh, any final question online? and offline. Two more here in the audience. Uh, maybe you go first. You were a little bit quicker. I have, can you, can you hear me like on screen? I have one question to you, Leila, and one to Margaret. And this is like the first um, regarding the Georgian case. And I guess, you know, the work of Evelina Gambino, who often stresses that um, these infrastructure projects are full of fractures and failures and not as seamless as they pretend to be. And you now added this very important point of like how many of these projects are not facilitated but fail because of competition between Chinese and European actors or Western actors, if I understood you correctly. So. It seems that in the end, there is this bleak space of potential investment that is never really realized. And I wonder if you see um, something coming out of this, like something emerging from these failures that could um, empower, in that case, maybe Georgian investors, as just as an example, but something that, like, something that gives a potential future to these failures. Uh, projects. And then the question to uh, Margaret was that you were, like, I have two questions actually. One is you were saying that the BRI might be a potential threat or potentially disintegrating EU. And I wonder why, why you even think this could be an intention of the Baltic Road Initiative, like why, why they would even want to disintegrate or um, sort of, yeah, um, be more uh, influential in the EU than the EU itself. And also, um, do you think we can really speak about competition between the Belt and Road Initiative and the European Global Gateway Initiative? First of all, concerning the gigantic uh, capital, investment capital that BRI has, which is far above anything that the Gateway Initiative can uh, afford. And also because, um, yeah, the BRI has just been very fast in docking at some strategic points that are really like hard to compete now at that stage. While at the same time, of course, China has a soft power problem. So it's not very popular while the EU still has some ways to, um, maybe convinced by uh, terminology like sustainability, like um, mutual, like real mutual benefit and so on and so forth. So what is your, what is the level of competition that you see here? That's my question. 
we're already a little bit over time, so it would be nice if you could try and uh, give short answers to these very good questions. Who would like to go first? Lila, you go first. Go first and uh, try to be very brief. First of all, thanks so much for the question. And I somehow really wish I was there in the audience and could also use um, break times to discuss this further. Indeed, I very much also draw on Evelina's work, who is a very dear colleague. Um, <clears throat> and I think my brief answer to this would be, and, and indeed, all, most of the cases that I presented here are the cases of failure. Um, and it's not even so much because of transnational competition, but because of difficulties with the government and local civil societies in terms of seeing benefits from the large infrastructure projects. And in all honesty, I don't know what can be, what can be the ways to empower um, either Georgian or other small um, societies. It's not that it's so easy to, uh, how do I say, make prescriptions, but for me, the hope would be local learning. And we can see this quite a lot. And I'm actually sometimes happy when some of the projects fail because you can see that local societies are understanding what is what can be burdensome, what can be beneficial. And this way, pushing both national governments and financial institutions to come back with better deals. Um, but another thing, and this comes back to Margot's uh, contribution and also my question to her um, is, perhaps transnational investment landscape has also to be changed to make some of these projects more feasible uh, and less easily contestable like we see in many cases now. Uh, I'll stop here so that Margot also gets time to respond. Okay then, um, I will start with your second question, whether the EU Global Gateway uh, can uh, really be um, a challenge to the Biden road. Uh, I think that uh, having this um, COVID-19 uh, problem for two years uh, with the problem of uh, uh, not um, continuing some work on the project, uh, problems with financing it, uh, problems with uh, lack of fiscal soundness and uh, problems with uh, uh, sustainability. All these issues have become much more pressing for countries in the region than before. So they are looking for projects uh, which have um, some um, right of um, rules and regulation, like they think of a rules-based approach and sustainability and uh, all this question has become more important than before. So I think that this uh, European initiative uh, can be successful if funding can be secured. But I think the uh, value-based approach uh, is the right uh, uh, strategy. Second, um, or the first question you said that uh, uh, you asked whether the Belt and Road uh, Initiative uh, has an can disintegrate um, Europe or the EU, and sure it can. Um, the example was the uh, 16 uh, plus one or 17 plus was a strategy. And um, there was this feeling of uh, divide and rule um, by many um, in the European Commission and um, uh, that uh, the uh, Chinese thought that they can just set up uh, infrastructure without uh, uh, or ignoring that there is this kind of uh, common policy and the transport policy is one of the common policies and very important for the long time competitiveness of Europe. So I think that there really was this uh, fear and some of this fear still exists in other fields which I described already, like this uh, investing in one uh, part of uh, European countries and uh, changing the um, economic growth uh, in, uh, and the well-being of some uh, areas uh, at the uh, expense of others. Thank you, Leila and Margot. Uh, we have one final question before we close the panel. Okay, I'll, uh, I'll try and keep it brief. 
really short. Uh, thank you, I really enjoyed the papers. Uh, I'm Peter Lindsmoper. Um, I'm here for six months in Leipzig, but so I'm based in New Zealand, and my area of expertise. Uh, I'm, I'm just saying I'm a bit of an interloper. My area of expertise is Pacific Islands, uh, and the Pacific Islands' Chinese investment into the Pacific. Uh, has been a source of political tension, particularly in uh, Samoa and in the Solomon Islands and Fiji. And Australian um, responses to Chinese infrastructure investment, particularly in PNG and in uh, Solomon Islands, has very much been a reactive uh, policy and a policy of trying to match Chinese investment and increasingly disconnecting um the kind of the the, the political projects of uh, promoting rule of law promoting democracy building uh liberalization of um social and civil rights um so what i wanted to ask is as uh there's an increasing competition in terms of um winning projects or getting um donor receiver or infrastructure investment receiver states uh, to choose their projects over um, the Chinese um, tenders. Are we seeing an increasing dilution of kind of tide attached aid or an increasing dilution of those um, complementary demands for rule of law, democracy building, and so on? I hope that was clear. Very good question, probably. Directed to Margot. Yeah, first. Can, can you maybe um, uh, ask this in a very short question because this was a very long uh, explanation, which I really find interesting, but I only got half of it. So, Tilo, could you translate it into a short question? Are we seeing uh, a dilution of um, the democracy building or rule of law? or political liberalization policies that often get attached to uh, infrastructure projects uh, promoted or offered by the West as there's increased competition with China in the delivery of these projects. Difficult to answer this question. So we have to do research on that. <laughs> to yeah. some part, yes, I think, but uh, it's difficult to answer this. Uh, it's a complex uh, question. So this is exactly what we are trying to study in our, I hope, for, <laughs> I hope uh, project, which we will win maybe soon. So I don't know, Lisa, can you add something on that? <laughs> in one or two sentences, it's very difficult to explain. I, I agree, Margot, it's very hard to say how will this go in a sense, because, and I think the question is great though, because what we observe is that in the first place, the concern has been that China is compromising on social environmental regulations, existing social environmental regulations that uh, say Western financial institutions would come with. And it's through avoiding those regulations that they get deals. On the other hand, there has been a concern also that, um, so countries are willing to go for Chinese investments because it doesn't come with political conditionalities. And if I understand well, this is also what you're talking about, right? Nobody asks uh, Central Asian governments to get democrat democratic when funding is coming from China. On the other hand, uh, it is said, and we still need to see uh, that there are implicit conditionalities. Um, the question of how will West respond Will the West also go about lowering its own social environmental regulations and political conditionalities in times of competition or vice versa, whether the West will offer different deals? Um, that's the question that we really have to see. But I do see the really appreciate the point of the question because it might be that this enhanced competition indeed lowers the level field for everybody or kind of moves every, all different actors to lower their uh, regulatory or, or break down their regulatory frameworks, right? Certainly one of the questions to be followed further. Uh, thank you very much uh, once again to Leila and Margot. Uh, for 
Thank you very much to the audience here in the room on the conference site and also online for joining us. It was a bit of a challenge to have overview of like both and uh, um, get justify uh, justifying both audiences. Uh, I think it was a very nice panel, a very nice discussion. Um, thank you for contributing. Sorry for being a little bit late, uh, but of course it was worth to take also the last questions from the audience. Um, you stay good, Leila, particularly all best to Hamburg, Margaret as well. And uh, for you here on site, enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you very much. Thank you.